my family mail i sent them a message because they're all coming back from they've been canoeing somewhere or something and i said i sent them a message saying don't please don't ring on the door and stand in the hall shouting because i'm on andrew gold's podcast typically i'd begin the podcast with a dramatic or revealing line but well that was certainly nice to hear from baron finkelstein of pinner and you don't often have lords on podcasts i defy you to find a single one and get in touch with me on andrew gold underscore okay on twitter or instagram to shout at me about it a close friend of former Prime Minister David Cameron and Chancellor George Osborne, Daniel Finkelstein is a Conservative peer and Times political columnist who has just released a collection of his best articles entitled Everything in Moderation. As I said to him in my email asking him on the show, the title of his book is the antithesis in every way to the podcast's epithet of On the Edge. But having read Daniel's insightful book, which I'd recommend to everyone looking to get a sense of perspective, it does correspond with many of my views about the world. When I have a psychopath, a paedophile, or a cult member on this podcast, it's not to celebrate or promote their ideas, but often to show the perils of living too far on the edge, too close to the precipice. That's why I like to round off those edges every other week by hearing from thought leaders. We've had anti-woke scholars Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, futurist Zoltan Istvan, and this week I'm interviewing feminist Helen Lewis. But right now, I'm honoured to introduce Daniel Finkelstein, a conservative who is perhaps known for his uber-modernist beliefs. He runs counter to the stereotype of the old-fashioned Tory with liberal views on pretty much everything. With a father who had been exiled in Siberia and a mother who was a survivor of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, he grew up with a clear grasp on the perils of the extremes and the safety and liberties extended by the centre. He's centre-right, and I ask him what makes a conservative and why so many people find them repellent. We talk about what he said to actor Martin Freeman and what it's like down the pub with David Cameron and George Osborne. What was really going on in Cameron's mind when he confused his football team of Aston Villa with West Ham. He also talks about Prime Minister Boris Johnson with rumours abound about his stepping down in the coming months. To non-Brits or those who aren't politically minded, there are some parts that delve into the nitty gritty, but Daniel does speak a lot about accessible and universal concepts. This is not a political podcast, and I'd be totally out of my depth framing it as such. It's a type of podcast where I ask, hey, what actually is a lord? And which football team does David Cameron support? As a writer, Daniel is not afraid to pluck cases from the popular or lowbrow zeitgeist to make broader political points. And I hope you feel this podcast reflects that accessibility. By the way, thanks again for listening and recommending this pod to friends. It's only a few months old, but has just entered the top two of Apple's documentary section in the UK. It's in their prestigious new and noteworthy category too right now. So I'm delighted to welcome all the new listeners. Please make sure to leave a review in the Apple Podcasts app if you're enjoying it. If you use another app, don't worry. There's no homework. Just enjoy. It's so funny while I'm reading your book, I'm hearing your voice all the time. And now I'm seeing you, your, your voice is here. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're enjoying the book. Oh, I'm loving it, actually. It's so my type of thing, because I just find myself constantly, I suppose, in moderation. Are you that kind of person at home? Would your family say you're quite a positive, in moderation person? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I would say that I, I try really to learn from my parents who very much saw things in proportion. Um, I, I, I tell in the book of a story where my father died, um, my mother, who you know loved him very deeply, really loved nothing else. I came back from a game, Chelsea were playing Norwich City, and I came to find my father died um, while I'd been away. I knew he was mm. very ill. Uh, and my mother was there, and after a few words about that, she said to me, what was the score? Um, and uh, that's very typical of my mum because she thought nothing was more ludicrous than a sort of uh, well the, she, her favourite joke was um, apart from that Mrs Lincoln how did you enjoy the theatre uh, <laughs> and um, this was her version of that joke she thinks that people who can't get things in proportion are, were ridiculous and uh, she taught me that and I try to live by it I mean everybody has their own character and um I wouldn't say that I'm like always calm with everybody. I'd be dishonest to say that, but I try. Yeah, that's all I think I try as well, you know. I wanted to bring up some shared uh, history that we have. My uncle and aunt are members of, of your synagogue and uh, they oh. know Ra Rabbi Aaron Goldstein very well. They absolutely yes. love him. 
I'm sure that if you're if they're around the Silicon Valley, we possibly know each other. Yeah. Uh, that's been a very important part of my life. Um, uh, in fact, just before talking to you, I was writing an article for the Jewish Chronicle about my reflections during the time of writing for the Times on being Jewish. And when you write a newspaper column, you have to write about who you are. Uh, I always used to tell columnists when I was when they were writing for me as when I was the common editor of the Times. It doesn't just matter what you think. People have to care that it's you that thinks it. So they have to know who you are. They have to they have to appreciate your your values and your politics and and a bit about your history and and your personality. That has to be authentic. You can't make that up. Uh, and you can't create a false picture of who you are if you want your column to to read as true and there's nothing else in writing opinion and by view unless you try to write what you, what you think is true. I realized the more that I thought about that how being Jewish um even though I'm not exceptionally either religiously observant i'm a bit but i'm not v exceptionally so and i'm certainly not devout yeah but being a jew as a ethnic identity and as a you know religious tradition has been very important to my writing i realize so uh, if your if your relations are in our synagogue then they're part of a community that means quite a lot to 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 my journalism and to my life well, and, and he's a very modern uh, rabbi as well, Aaron Goldstein, from everything I've heard about him. And, yes. and uh, it, it's interesting because you have a very modern, for, I guess when people hear that you're a lord and you're a conservative, they might imagine something different. You're very modern, uber modern, as you say in the, right in the book, one of the uber modernists. And the person who so introduced us by Twitter is a friend of mine called Tom Gatson, who worked for Steve Barkley. He's very young, cool trendy or whatever good looking guy and in some ways i suppose he's uh the antithesis of how many might view a conservative today yeah. why why is that look there are a number of things one, one of the things is uh, at the moment i think the conservative party has made a sort of demographic choice um which which i think is rather a short-term one uh it, it's um chosen to appeal to older voters uh, you have to build a democratic coalition um, somehow. And, you know, when the Conservative Party thinks about where it puts its resources, for example, in the NHS or in the uh, or in a old pension lock, uh, yeah. a triple lock on pensions, that is putting a lot of your resources in one generation. You know, Jeremy Corbyn, when he had billions of pounds uh, that he was throwing around, it was to... Um, people on tuition fees, right? So uh, that's a different demographic choice. And so part of the answer is simply that the parties have made different demographic uh, choices. And therefore, there's a lot of young people who are um, more on the more left inclined. That is not always, it is usually the case that young people, particularly males, are more pro violent solutions to things and radical overthrowings of things while, they, while they're young. Um, mm. And um, that, but that can be right wing as well as left wing. Um, yeah. Interestingly enough, the, the group in the United States who was most in favour of the Vietnam War, I think there's an essay on that in the book, yes. were, were young males, um, and in a, in the United States. Um, and you would have thought, given that they were the people who had to go fighting, they'd be the most opposed to it. Well, they were. They were the most opposed to it and the most in favour of it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but more people in that group were in favour of it than any other group in the population. It's partly about the attraction of radical change, and I, and but partly about the demographics of prosperity in Britain. How would you then speak to a, a very young person who might have been you or me as a, a teenager or something? Because when I was a teenager, yeah, I, I totally went along with the, you know, fuck the Tories and, and you know, they're all horrible. Look, it's a very difficult decision for everybody because uh, when you choose a political party, you're choosing a coalition. And the first point to understand is you are choosing to ally yourself with people who don't fully agree with you, if you bother at all with political parties. That's what you're doing. You can't, there, there aren't, there aren't, you know, I recognise this very early on in my political life, there aren't going to be millions and millions of Jews from Hendon Central, um, you know, who with with uh, master's degrees in systems analysis, you know, the world is a very varied place. So the first thing to, the first step in choosing any political background is to accept nothing's perfect and you are going to have to ally with a load of people who don't agree with you. While it is tempting to believe that um, all you have to decide in life is whether you care or whether you don't. And then if you do, you're on the left. And if you don't, you're on the right. That is really much more complicated than that. The biggest problem in politics is the allocation of resources. 
uh, and the and the making of resource you know and 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 that also involves trying to get more resources i'm attracted to write ultimately for two big reasons um that has put me on the center right rather than center left yeah. i essentially think the capitalist system has been highly successful in lifting people out of poverty and creating prosperous and therefore liberal and democratic and tolerant societies when that flags and fails societies become less liberal less democratic less tolerant uh and so therefore uh successful economies are critical and that has been my first reason uh my first big reason for being on the right. The second is um, that I believe that when you, that you have to grapple with the fact that resources are finite. And um, while it is nice to say um, every uh, difficult cause, every problem must have a government solution to which we can put money, it isn't actually the case. You can't simply can't do that and i believe the, the the right has been more realistic about that but i will acknowledge if you join on the right sometimes the right is slower than the left to see uh the um the importance of liberal causes partly because the right being conservative uh you know it takes time for us to see that something is not a passing fad that it's a genuine human right or that it's a a way in which society has changed and so yeah. and while, while conservatives are quite good at finishing reforms like gay marriage or, um, you know, full voting rights for women, uh, we're not necessarily as good at starting those reforms. I think the rights record on on gay rights was was pretty miserable. Yeah. So um, I would say, uh, you know, the choice is not a simple one because not everybody is going to agree with you, but that's the reason for my choice. Okay. It's really interesting because I think a lot of people listening who who are who are maybe how I was or how I've been, which is, you know, the Tories are evil or the Tories are this and that, when they if they read your book, uh, you do sound really progressive. I mean, t- so the statue uh, debate, for example, going on at the moment, uh, you were very much, you know, you, you were very understanding of the fact that Churchill was a, a white supremacist. I had a hilarious, although in some ways, really frustrating experience with the article that's in the book on uh, Winston Churchill. In general, I haven't changed the headlines in the book from um, from the headlines that were in the paper. Mm. But I did make an exception to this article. Uh, it said that um, Churchill uh, uh, was a racist, but he was a great man. That's what the headline said. Uh, but the real article I wrote was, in fact, that, he- that Churchill was a great man, but he was a racist. It's a different, uh, and, I, and that's the way I put it. <laughs> My audience for that column was people who, like me, think that Churchill did amazing things during the Second World War, which were very important yeah. to my family, as you, as you know from my family history. So like me, they, that was the case. But you cannot run away from his record, and you have to accept that he's a racist, and that is not just a standard that we impose upon him now because ideas about race have changed. It was actually thought about him at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that's, so I wanted to write that article. On Twitter, I got into a lots of trouble from people who were saying that I was dismissing the fact that he was a racist and therefore, ins- and simply insisting that he was a great man. It was one of those confected rows. It was really, really instructive. Uh, but as a result, I, ch- I switched the headline round in the book. That's amazing how much difference uh, putting the, reversing the clauses just makes. Maybe I would have got attacked anyway. I mean, one of the things that, that happens when you are a conservative is people make assumptions about you. I noticed this. I used to do this panel on Newsnight, hmm. um, and often that consisted of me saying quite critical things about the Conservative Party on a prime BBC show. Uh, and always I'd get conservatives saying I've been great on the programme and Labour people saying I've been terrible. They hadn't really heard much beyond who, uh, where my political background was. And you get that the whole time. Oh, people don't care, do they, about anything? Well, it's more that I think part of our political identity is partisan. Mm. um, And... um, we often don't assimilate much beyond that. That that's I'm not saying I'm any different to that. I, I'm sure I can fall into into that trap too. It's just quite noticeable. You're pushing a very uh, which which I'm a fan of this uh, very liberal progressive conservatism um, socially. Does it wind you up when you're sort of trying to promote that side of it and then Jacob Rees-Mogg sort of lies down on the bench like a maniac? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been as you as you know from the book. There's a very critical essay about. Jacob Rees-Mogg in there. 
Um, and sure, I have a disagreement with him, but you know, you have to decide ultimately who your allies are. So I do take a degree of, I have to take a degree of responsibility for him, right, <laughs> as he does for me. And um, because of that, uh, of course, it's frustrating when he acts in a way that makes that responsibility more burdensome, as it were. You know, he differs with me. We ha we have big political disagreements, and I think at the core of it is our belief about the modern world. You know, there is obviously a part of Jacob Rees. Bog, um, who actually, when you talk to him, meet him, is civilized. And I loved his dad, um, who uh, used to write columns for, for me when I was comment editor at the Times, and, and whom I adored. And um, ah. he, he, he was. There's, there's a part of him that rejects the way the modern world has has changed, and I fundamentally accept that. I think you know, in that way, my, it's a correct description to call me progressive. I don't think it's a particularly useful political term because everyone uses it. But I don't think the Canadian title of progressive conservative is a contradiction in terms. How much do you think that your writing influences politics or is it more predicting what's happening? No, I, I try not to predicting mainly because I um, want to avoid the obvious thing that will happen which is you say something's quite likely to happen and then it doesn't and the fact that you said it was quite likely is eliminated right so the 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 the, the truth is all things that are going to happen in politics in the future are probabilistic you can't say for certain what will happen so there are relatively few predictions that are made in the book i've tried to indicate in the book where it was i'd made bad predictions in one or two places included those um, mm. but generally speaking i don't do that it's more two things i do one is analysis to try to explain what's happening and the second thing i try to do is to try to shape arguments that some readers with my bent of mind will 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 agree with and helps them to express or you know deepen or understand their own argument and sometimes yeah as a result of that it emboldens my friends and maybe um puts off or uh, puts off those people who don't agree you know or maybe you know makes them think again you are quite friendly in my writing saying with david cameron and george osborne yes have there ever been moments where they've called you up and said you know daniel what, what have you just written well no never annoyed actually george george is a very close friend of mine and so he'll tend to do it in a, and he's also as anyone who knows him got sort of quite a good sense of humor and he he would he thought much of my commentary about the sort of need for more independence in politics was completely naive and ridiculous. So there's a column in the book about um, why uh, the gang instinct in politics leads us away from good solutions. And, and he read that and he thought it was fine as an intellectual argument, but ludicrously impractical, right? I'm not sure I'd necessarily think that now, but maybe you would. But anyway, so he took the me out of my column for, for, for that reason. Um, but now, they've never been angry with a column that I've written, I, uh, I suppose. But, you, but, but I do know, I do remember when I was writing Leaders for the Times that, I mean, David Cameron did note to me that two particular positions the times had taken on health reforms weren't consistent with each other so he did what he did read them pretty carefully that's interesting that's interesting so he you're a big football fan just i've just thought off the top of my head right now because i remember he, was it was it him that wasn't sure if he was west ham or aston villa oh yeah well it's interesting so i went to i'm a big football fan and i i'm a big chelsea fan uh, as as at that point um was his youngest was his son young? You know, not his youngest son, but his, his younger son. Um, and we went to football together to see Villa play Chelsea. It was Chelsea proceeded to then win eight one. And after that, we would constantly um, text each other during Villa Chelsea games. David was actually one of those funny things. He was more of a fan than he lets on. He really mm. enjoys watching Villa. And um, he doesn't talk much about football and he's never pretended to be a big football fan. Um, and I think actually weirdly was a bigger football fan. Uh, but I spoke to him about the West Ham thing and he said he'd woken up, he'd got sort of gone pretty early and he was reading from an auto queue and he decided to depart from the auto queue just for a paragraph to give it a bit of life. And that's when he said this thing. And <laughs> the moment he said it, he thought, I can't believe those words came out of my oh, mouth because I don't support West Ham. And so it isn't, it isn't that he doesn't know which football team he supported. He just 
misspoke. People find that difficult to believe, but one of the reasons I know it's true is because I know that particular instance is true. <laughs> People can just say things and then afterwards think I can't I don't really I can't even remember saying it apart from yeah. he could remember saying it, but I guess it's the colour scheme, wasn't it, that threw threw him off. I mean it was a real thick of it moment. I think he, he says it was because um I think Karen Brady was in the audience and also somebody had mentioned it earlier in the day. I think that was the reason, but he doesn't he doesn't know particularly why it was. One of the articles in the book that I really enjoyed, I suppose going back to to the difference between left and right a little bit, was was an address to Martin Freeman, the actor from The Office and The Hobbit. Did he ever get back to you? No, I met him <laughs> even actually, and he didn't mention it. Maybe he didn't read it, but um, I met him at... Uh, uh, one of my obsessions is the Beatles, and there are, as you know, um, one of my favourite things in the book is is my interview with George Martin, the Beatles mm-hmm. producer. There's also a piece on Brian Epstein there, and I think Martin Freeman, who's done a podcast on on the White Album, he's uh, also a mad Beatles fan. So we right. met at an Apple event, but he didn't read it. He was very nice, um, but he, I, he he didn't mention it. He he must have read it. Come, yeah, to, to truthful. My, my experience with these things, is I always think people have not read the kind of read it but everyone if it mentions them they always have so i suspect it probably did but he didn't mention it okay i wonder what he thought of that i guess it, for those who haven't read it they should read it they should get the book um but but your point again what, what he was saying that you couldn't possibly vote uh, tory and be somebody who has empathy yeah and it wasn't just that he said he said i he was labor because he'd been brought up to be a nice person basically and i was sort of saying well either you're saying my parents had a hideous failure and they failed to bring me up yeah. as a nice person or, or that they didn't bring me up as a nice person. It was even worse. And I, I can't think he means that. I mean, to be fair to him, I expect he just thinks this will make a ghastly choice uh, of political party. But really my point in that column was it's all a bit more complicated than that. You know, so for instance, Ed Miliband's policy in that election, in my opinion, so please forgive me, those of you who don't agree with this, um, was to... Uh, was to continue a larger borrowing policy. Now that is a policy that 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 means that somebody else has to pay our deficit, right, in yeah. the form of debt. Um, and um, you, there are lots of arguments you can have. Um, one of them is oh, we won't create that debt, or the debt doesn't matter. But it is making a decision that passes the deficit from people who live now to people who live in the future who have to pay it back there's a yeah. fairness issue there now what he was kind of saying was the fairness issues that he was talking about they mattered and the fairness issues that i was interested in didn't matter and i disagreed with that with that view but okay. i did i would say it, i thought it was quite brave of him to do a political broadcast and there's something very attractive about his personality which made it very effective not ed Miliband's, who as a public figure didn't appeal and that's an interesting thing because I think anyone who meets him, I do like him. Why is it that these people always seem much more charismatic and likable once they're, you know, after they've been in office or leader of the party? So part of it is that once a sort of view has been taken about who Ed Miliband was and what he was doing, it builds into a story about him and everything has to be consistent. And some of it is completely ludicrous. That that idiotic story about the bacon sandwich was grotesquely unfair on him. Right? Yeah. It, it, it was sort of taken to personify his leadership in a way that was that told a story about him in a way that was completely absurd and I, and I do think we often there was that thing with Gordon Brown as well where he was supposed to be utterly brilliant before the election that he didn't call in in um in 2007 um and then the moment he didn't call it he was thought to be that like everything he did was incredibly stupid well it wasn't very likely that he was either a genius before or adult <laughs> afterwards yeah. and I think sometimes you have these stories and we build up about, up about people, and it's not very fair. I think um, so going back to the Martin Freeman thing, I think there's a lot uh, online. As it gets very um, toxic, the debates between sort of left and right, and the right and the centre often call the left snowflakes. Uh, that term, and I've been thinking for ages that that's the worst possible term. Uh, from a PR perspective, that the right could call the left because it's exactly what they want to be called. Because the, if they if they trade in empathy, if you're if that's if that's the sort of gold of the day, who's more empathetic? That that's perfect for them. These kind of insults that people throw at each other, it's all a bit pathetic. I've been called that um, weirdly by people on the left as well as by people on the right. <laughs> it's not much of an insult, really. Virtue signaling—that's the other one I don't get. When mm. someone says you're virtue signaling, I mean, what's wrong with signaling virtue? But isn't that what you suggested about Martin Freeman? Um, no, I mean, I would never use that 
uh, phrase about him. He wasn't virtue signaling. I think what he was, I didn't object to him claiming to be virtuous. I probably wouldn't have written, but I did object to him saying that he was a virtuous compared to me, you know, because <laughs> I thought that was a sort of incredibly arrogant, presumptuous thing to say. I think that's what a lot of people mean when they criticize people for being, for virtue signaling, is that I think they're saying, you think you have more virtue than I do. Yeah, I guess. Mm. But I think, um, what they sometimes mean by it is um, you shouldn't say that virtuous thing because all you're doing is signalling it. But I, you're also saying it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, do politicians care still in your experience or is it a case of, of winning or having the right strategy and getting into power? You know, all of them do care. Uh, even if they're not empathetic people, they end up caring as a matter of, of, of professional necessity. Um, one of the things that I think is very interesting is people describing politicians as out of touch. And some politicians have a better grasp on what voters think than others. And some, are, you know, are kind of able to absorb it more than others. But the truth is that if you're involved in politics, you spend an awful lot of your time talking to people, you end up absorbing what other people think a lot of the time, and you end up caring about people's problems. You, you can't avoid it, really. Uh, if Unless you're a completely uncaring sort of person, which can happen in in all walks of life. You know, Mao was a total narcissist. So, you mm. know, just an example. So people can be like that, but it's unusual. Um, and I, I think as people progress in politics, uh, they may become more professional. Uh, they may become more aware of how to win and lose elections, but they never lose caring about what people think and believe and are willing to accept and what they think is right and wrong. So if you're, uh, I don't know, down, I don't know if you're down the pub with David Cameron or whatever, what, what is it like? And is, is, did, when he was in power, was he concerned? I guess he must have been concerned more about his position and every, when you're that high up and everyone's scrutinizing you. But was he also worried like, oh God, I'm worried about these people and those people and how, how I can help them in society? Sure, of course he was. I mean, look, it was a very difficult period then because... He ended up coming to power just as uh, um, they were having to cut public spending. And I remember sitting with George uh, in number 11 and him saying to me, I can't believe that Gordon Brown went around the country opening all these sure start centres and I've now got to go around the country closing them. And he was very worried about that. But he also thought, and I think he was right, um, that we had a big structural deficit and he had to do something about it and it required him to be tough about it. And actually, it's not enough just to care about things. You also have to, you know, take a reasonable view of the overall budget and make decisions about priorities. You have to be fairly tough to do that. You've got to do it in the end and you've got to therefore have a degree of robustness. And I guess that robustness gets gets mistaken for a lack of empathy by by some people. Yeah, I would think it did. You know, you can be completely caring if your economy is going down the drain and you can't afford to pay for anybody's benefits. It doesn't matter if you care that they don't have it. If they don't have it anyway. I was living for a while in South America, about um, 10 years. And uh, there was so many, I was in Argentina, there were so many Venezuelans who had to get down there. And when I saw Corbyn, he refused to criticize what was happening in Venezuela whenever he was asked. What were your biggest concerns over if Corbyn had gotten into power? Well, okay, so there were two things about his position on Venezuela, both of which concern me. The first thing is that Jeremy Corbyn took a Lenin's view of imperialism. Lenin's view of imperialism was that capitalism was only made possible by the imperialist policies uh, that colonized other countries and expropriated their property. Um, and uh, as a result of it, if you wanted to end capitalism, what you have to do is to support the anti-colonial resistance movements of other countries. And that led to, and that was therefore his foreign policy, right? Uh, and he was, as a result, supporting a lot of um, the, a lot of regimes, including that in Iran, um, and actually Putin as well, uh, whom I thought were fundamentally anti-liberal. Um, and I thought that was also true in his support for Chavez. My second problem uh, is that I think he thought that Chavez's government was a model. Um, and in a way, it was a model. So what Chavez did was he borrowed very, very large sums of money, closed down the ability of the oil industry to raise prices, and raised the salaries of all the oil workers. This was incredibly popular with everybody, except for the fact that it meant that you couldn't maintain the oil wells, because if you increase the salaries and cap the prices, you haven't got enough money to yeah. reinvest. 
And so what happened in the end was that the oil industry began to collapse as well. He appointed, you know, his own mates to run it and all that. Uh, and Corbyn openly thought that that was a Bolivaran model that we all ought to follow. Would a third thing be uh, the potential, uh, especially with your past, I was going to say anti-Semitism. I mean, uh, your your father um, escaped what Siberian exile, was it? And your, your mother was in a concentration camp. Uh, so yeah. does that, with, with that in mind... Yeah, look. First of all, I don't understand hysterical about Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think he was, uh, he's not Stalin, you know, he was the wrong end of the ice pick. Um, <laughs> my view is that socialism uh, has never found a workable model that doesn't end up in oppression or, and complete poverty. That doesn't mean that social democracy hasn't. Social mm. democracy is completely possible and it's been tried elsewhere. Corbyn did not believe in that. Corbyn did not believe in social democracy. Neither did John McDonnell. They believed in socialism, which was something different to that. I believe that to be completely impractical. And in the end, I think it does lead to oppressive regimes. Mm. So one of the constant arguments in my book, um, and hopefully it leads to some of the lighter things as well, uh, to, to the um, piece on David Bowie, on Brian Epstein, on George mm -hmm. Martin, um, on Walt Disney. Yes. Is um, the importance of capitalism to progress and to uh, cultural diversity and even to, to progressive change. Um, and, um, you know, one of my problem, one of my fears about socialism is it would uh, stymie that as well. That Disney article was great. And, and you were saying that it, it, he was falsely labelled with being an anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. um, so... Where would where do you stand on Corbyn on that matter? I'm very careful about using the phrase anti Semite mm. to describe him. I think in the end, the best way of describing him is he was he became an ally of anti Semites and a lot of anti Semites were allies of him and he didn't want to do anything about it. Uh, yeah. he thought the whole thing was phony. Uh he couldn't see it in front of his eyes. Uh and as a result, again and again he did things that were that were anti-Semitic. Um, so, for example, his endorsement of the of that of a grotesquely anti-Semitic mural yeah. was an example which he couldn't see was anti-Semitic. Was an astonishing example of that. Uh, so, partly because I think you should use the word sparingly. I have never publicly called Jeremy Corbyn an, an anti-Semite, okay. but I think that he definitely, uh, you know, brought into the Labour Party and saw as allies a lot of people who were anti-Semites and he didn't couldn't see that and didn't want to do anything about it. Yeah. Did you call him that privately? No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, didn't I don't do that. One of the things about the columns, actually, is you end up pretty much writing publicly whatever you think. You can't really divide yourself if you don't. Sometimes you decide, I'm not going to write a column about that. I'm open that I excluded from the book one particularly grotesque column that I wrote about Scotland in which irritated at being told what the English should and shouldn't say about Scotland. I intemperately wrote a column saying I didn't care what Scotland did if it wanted, it could do whatever it wanted. And that is just not true at all. I do care about it. So that didn't, sometimes you write columns and you think a few years later, God, that was a <laughs> stupid view. What is a Lord for the layman? Well, that's an interesting question. So we have two houses, um, a fully elected House of Commons and an unelected House of Lords. And the unelected House of Lords has weak powers um, which effectively amount to, to being able to delay legislation. And even that is a power that is almost never used by the House. And the reason they rarely use it is because uh, the threat of it allows the House of Commons to consider points made by the House of Lords to uh, reform legislation. That's not okay. done on the level of principle. So the House of Lords will never deal with the overall principle of the bill. It's done on details. And what the House of Lords does is use the expertise uh, that you might get in an unelected house. So you have um, lawyers and uh, the, the astronomer royal and somebody who's been the head of a civil service and somebody who's been a teacher. Uh, you have that, that kind of experience to draw on uh, and use that to make detailed recommendations to the commons, which then get incorporated into the bill. The, um, they, there was a time when everybody who was appointed to the House of Lords was hereditary. So lots yes. of people who sat in the House of Lords only sat in it because their parents sat in it. Now the vast majority of the House of Lords is appointed. Um, and they're appointed um, because of all sorts of experience. In my case, I was an advisor to John Major. Uh, I'd been an advisor to, 
to William Hague. And then uh, I was close to David Cameron, who re relied on my advice, and he thought I'd make a good amender of legislation. That's why he put me in mm. um, that, uh, that, that job. Um, so um, you, it, it's a slightly weird thing because it's also an honour uh, to be a lord, you know, obviously, uh, yeah. in addition to the privilege of sitting in the house. Um, and so there's a slight muddle between um, the legislative appointment and the honours system, which I think probably could do with being uh, reviewed. But if we did have an elected chamber, you would have a more, a chamber that was, you know, there was a lot to be said for it, uh, democratically, but it would either approve everything that the government did because it had the same majority as the House of Commons, mm. or it would stop everything the government did. The one thing that makes the second chamber work is that because we know we're unelected, we retreat once the House of Commons has made it clear that it's not moving. I guess that could be abused, though, because I've, I've heard that um, a lot of people, it's because they give big party donations, get appointed. In general, the appointments to the House of Lords are people who've got expertise of one kind or another. There are in the House of Lords some business people, and naturally speaking, those business people who've been appointed to the House of Lords also tend to have been donors, right? Because if you're a big conservative or Labour person who's got lots of money and you're a huge supporter of the party, it's liable that you will have given some money to the party. But for example, um, Lord Bamford, right, and who's the head of JCB, is in the House of Lords, well, not because he's donated to the Conservative Party, although he has, but because he runs a big industrial concern and his experience is therefore valuable. Um, so um, I think there are strong arguments for a more democratic chamber, but there is a problem with it. An elected chamber would assert its rights and every piece of legislation would either go sailing through or would be delayed. I don't know how to solve that problem, even yeah. though I see the argument for an elected chamber. Mm. But I'm just saying that is what will happen. I don't feel particularly protective of it, to be quite honest. It's yeah. it's actually quite a burden on my time to, to be in the in the second chamber. I'm not sure, you know, I kind of love it above all other things. I'd certainly very happily be gainfully employed doing other things. Uh, mm. But I agreed to do this. I thought it would be interesting, and it is. It's quite a cool thing to have in your name as well isn't it <laughs> yeah look it was a great i'm not you know running away from that because it would be silly <laughs> no, it was a really nice thing to happen oh. it was something that um also you know i'd given a lot of advice and time to prime ministers to governments to political leaders which i thought was important in in advance of the things that i believe it was lovely to have that acknowledged as well in such a generous way so yeah it's a nice thing Hmm. Um, one of the things that you, you, you talked about in the book, uh, which was interesting, again, is the private life of, of a politician it gives us the insight of, of their character. You talked about Berlusconi, of course. Um, how do you feel uh, about that with respect to Boris Johnson? Look, so the point I made there was I don't think um, it's automatically a resignation issue that somebody's got a complicated private life, partly because you don't always know every detail of it and every reason for it but it's certainly an uh, an insight into them and not something that you know those those people who say i don't know why the tabloids run all these stupid stories they're totally irrelevant don't think it's irrelevant when it comes to boris right yeah. and they're right if you if you are, were trying to write a rounded portrait of this prime minister how could you possibly ignore um you know his love life you you can't um it, it's a it's an insight into him i there are lots of things about it, but just as an example of it, um, Boris is quite an undisciplined individual, um, and um, he's always at the centre of it, of uh, of his own story, right? And yeah. both of those things are present in his behaviour towards his partners and spouses and, and other women that he's had relationships with. Uh, and you can't pretend that's not true about him i flatly disagree with boris in in his columns who argues that this doesn't matter and of course it doesn't mean that every decision that he takes is only relevant you know this is important only to that but if you are going to be prime minister of the country it's perfectly reasonable that people take a rounded view of who you are as a person because all of that does matter it does say something about you Obviously, it, it broke the news or rumours broke that he is looking to step down or he's not um, up for the job since his corona and all of those things. 
I've also heard that there's a suggestion that uh, he actually has more children than anyone realised. I don't want to speculate on 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 that. That that. I mean, I don't know anything about it really. Um, that's but um, but. Uh, no, anyway, that's fine. I don't, I don't really. We all know, you know, because he's obviously, you know, on his third. Probably, you know, he's engaged to what will be his third wife, so we know that he's had a sort of tangled uh, love life. That's kind of public, but what's resulted from that? I really just don't know. Well, the only reason I, it was, I thought it relevant was just because uh, I heard that being prime minister, you can't engage in other jobs uh, that you would normally do. And he was used to a certain way of living. Oh, I've always thought that I've always thought, you know, leaving aside that quest, the question of size of family and all that. Uh, I've always thought that it would, you know, Boris has always taken Churchill's view of income, you know, which is, let's just uh, earn more money. And he's very industrious in doing it. And, and by the way, very impressive. I mean, I've, what, I've known Boris for a long time. Um, what he's succeeded in doing in making himself a public personality, even leaving aside the achievement of becoming prime minister, what he succeeded in doing is let's let's not eliminate from a consideration of his character this immense side of it. He is incredibly industrious, right? Uh, for all that people say, he's lazy nonsense. He is incredibly industrious. Uh, he is um, he has succeeded in making himself, you know, through his wit. Um, incredibly sort of famous, well-known, loved by a lot of people. I mean, now mm. obviously controversial with others, right? But um, that is very impressive uh, thing. Um, but part of it was about trying to earn a lot of money um, and he built up a lot of income. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that's a problem. How does Dave feel about him? Um, well, he did, you'd have to ask, you'd have, have him on mm. and ask. Um, <laughs> I think David, interestingly, I think David is much more forgiving of him than he was mm. of Michael. I think that's partly because he's kind of always expected slightly wayward, much more independent behaviour from... from um, Boris. You know, I think he kind of, with a slight shrug, thinks, you know, Boris will beat Boris. Oh. Um, and... Um, he finds him frustrating, and he obviously disagrees with him. He, he was very disappointed that Boris decided to support leaving the European Union. Um, but I sort of think he thinks of Boris as being a friend. How do you feel about the future of the Tory party and, and, and the future of, of our society? The Conservative Party's future is quite uncertain. I think that it's made a big strategic choice, and not a good one necessarily, uh, and that is to go to appeal to kind of older, more, less urban less liberal voters when the country is becoming more urban uh more liberal it may rue the choices it's made now uh, but we'll see what because i think boris is still in the process of making a choice about what sort of government he wants and who he is as prime minister and that's what i was arguing last week i think that's a decision that's a work in progress okay. um as for the country well look i still think I'm still pretty optimistic about the country, despite everything. Uh, I do think we've made our life more difficult by leaving the European Union, but we'll wait and see who was right about that. Um, I think we've now got the chance to be an international trading you know, centre of power it, it, that's independent. I think that is more a piece of rhetoric than a reality, uh, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, and so... Uh, we'll see. Uh, but I think fundamentally, we still live in a very civilised, um, uh, prosperous and um, liberal country. And, you know, long may it remain like that. It's a very moderate answer. Um, last question. Are you excited for Chelsea this year? Because they've bought well. Uh, really? Yeah, really. Look, I, you know, the truth is that um, money uh, really talks in football. Uh, yeah. And um, your wages bill is related to your... Um, your points um i did think a massive gap had opened up between liverpool manchester city on the one hand and chelsea on the other um and i think both chelsea and manchester united would have closed that gap a bit obviously if city get messy at least for a season or two uh, that yeah. will be very good for them but in the end i'd rather have Havertz, i think because hmm. he's only 21 yeah i'm a spurs fan we've got Mourinho. uh we've got your old your old boy <laughs> I love Mourinho. Do you? Yes. I'm optimistic in the long run, but the, the the way they were playing the last few months of last season, I've never seen anything like it with the the way it's so different to any other manager. Maybe Atletico Madrid play a little bit like just the low block all the time. It is, yeah. But you know, the crucial thing was you were losing before and then you stopped losing.
Maybe Daniel's thoughts on football give something away about his political side. The Tories, in his mind, may not be pretty, but they get things done. In that sense, Tottenham's Jose Mourinho is the archetypal Tory, able to win ugly. Apologies for the footy chat. I only brought it up because Daniel is a huge football fan and famously used to have a column of predictions and stats and things for the game. It was amazing talking to a lord, a baron, a Times journalist with an OBE. He was clearly mature enough not to gossip or dish out the dirt I was looking for with respect to Boris and his potential kids. But it was great to get an insight into what these people, who seem like machines in suits, are really like. If you enjoyed that, please make sure to review on Apple or share with friends. It all really helps more than you probably realise. I'm not 100% about which podcast will go up next Monday, but I am recording one this week with Helen Lewis, so it might be her. She's a leading feminist who, much like Daniel Finkelstein, is too smart and nuanced to be pigeonholed as one thing or the other. I came across her via her brilliant BBC radio documentary, The Roots of Woke Culture, and her GQ debate with a hot-headed Jordan Peterson. Now I'm reading her fantastic book, Difficult Women, and I suggest you do too.